Greetings, friends of astrobiology, and welcome to a brand new episode of Ask an Astrobiologist, a show where we celebrate science and celebrate scientists. My name is Sanjay Som, and this program is made possible by contributions from the NASA Astrobiology Program, ELSI, the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech, and the nonprofit Blue Marble Space. Today, we're absolutely delighted to welcome astrobiologist extraordinaire Dr. Sean Domagal Goldman, who's a research space scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the state of Maryland in the United States. He's an expert in the chemistry of the environment back in the early Earth. He's also, he also simulates the atmospheres of planets that are far, far away orbiting other stars that we call exoplanets. And he's also an enabler of future telescopes that will help us discover life, hopefully, and we know that it's there on other worlds. Sean, it's great to have you today. Thanks, Sanjoy. Happy to be here. Big fan of the show. Thank you. Before we start, though, it's time for your monthly background quiz. I know everybody's excited about that. Mike, if you could put up the background from last month. This beautiful setting is, of course, Bumpass Hell, and I have to make sure to pronounce this properly. This is a beautiful hot spring in Lassen Volcanic National Park in the state of California in America. The beautiful colors come from the different minerals and also from the microbes, the little microbial organisms that live in the water. And it's a nice analog to planetary settings that we know, in fact, possibly existed on the uh, planet Mars. Uh, this month, the background is behind me. Some clues for it, as you can probably see from these structures here. Um, and we'll let you know next time. The winner of this month's Ask a Background Quiz is at Twisted Marv. Congratulations, at Twisted Marv. You have won the complete set of the Astrobiology comic books, as well as some stickers with the NASA logo on it. Please get in touch with us uh, via social media or however you find us, and we'll get those to you. Thanks for playing. What is behind me? We'll let you know next month. Sean, before we start talking about science, because you do so many things and it's so exciting to talk about this, I want to get to know you a bit more first. Um, how did you become a scientist in the first place? You have Earth and Mars behind you. What triggered that interest? The thing, I, for as long as I remember I, knowing what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a scientist. The one exception to that is there was one point in high school where I was also pursuing a broadcast, a sportscasting career, and I decided I wanted to make news instead of report on other people making news. Um, although here, you know, we're kind of on a news program today, so there you go. Um, I do remember being with my brother in terms of like turning to astrobiology. I was with my brother. We lived in Chicago. You couldn't see the stars at night, uh, but we went out one night and there was an eclipse, a lunar eclipse, and so you could see the stars for a change. And we were just like laying on the lawn in the front yard, kind of staring up at the sky, and my brother said, you know, do you think there's anyone out there? And I thought I didn't have a good answer to that question, uh, but it sounded like something that would be fun and, and, uh, and challenging to pursue. So uh, I, I started looking at astrobiology as a career. That was, I was in college then, and I never looked back. It's fun, I get to meet great people like you. <laughs> it's amazing how looking at the stars just opens up the soul a little bit. I remember during the solar eclipse last summer, I had to stand up, literally, as this moon was crossing the sun, because it's just so moving. So I totally get what you're saying. So how did you, how did you become an astrobiologist? It's, one can approach a discipline from a bunch of different tra trajectories. Um, what was your path? So I, I really leaned into astrobiology from kind of that moment forward. Um, and I, when I went to graduate school, I looked specifically for programs that were good at astrobiology. So I was looking at the University of Washington, your alma mater for grad school, as well as Penn State, which is where I ended up going, um, because they both had specific programs in astrobiology uh, and were offering degrees in it. Or at least that time, Washington was offering a certificate, but now they both offer degrees. Um, I went into the geosciences in part because I had some expertise in geochemistry um, and I could do some modeling. I didn't like. I knew I didn't want to be in a lab because um, there's chemicals in a lab that can kill you, and I'm a klutz, and that's a bad combination. Um, so I, you know, I decided I wanted to do modeling. Um, I decided I wanted to do astrobiology, and I decided I wanted to do something with geochemistry because I had some background in that. And so, you know, those three things put together, um, the best place I thought, and I think I was right in retrospect, but everyone thinks they're right in retrospect for stuff like this, uh, was Penn State. So I went there, studied early Earth and like why the oxygen oxygen we're breathing, like how it first came to be on, on our planet and when and why it happened when it did. Uh, then started thinking about like, you know, that for exoplanets and stuff like that. But that's how I, I really got started by doing kind of a targeted search for graduate school programs. 
And by modeling, of course, you don't mean walking around university dressed really nicely like you are today, but actually computer simulations of atmospheres of the ancient Earth and of other Earth. Right. So you can simulate yeah, the first that kind of modeling, you can, you can, yeah, people can make a career with the first kind of modeling, but I, I definitely can't. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's doing, you know, simulations, you know, on a computer like this one or sometimes on a supercomputer that we're dialing into uh, and running our simulations there. Uh, and, and really what that's about is it's like you try to take some, you know, intuition you have as, uh, as a scientist of like how a natural system works and you try to code that up with some math um, and, and then put that in the computer and then let the computer decide how things play out. It's fun. If you like computers, if you like math, you like science, modeling is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so your work in the environmental chemistry of the ancient Earth kind of contributed to our understanding that more than half of Earth history was devoid of any oxygen in the atmosphere. Is that right? Yeah, and, and this is something I think we've known as scientists for a long time, but what we started thinking about is like, what, how do we actually kind of know exactly when it happened and, and why it happened when it did? And how do we get in, you know, scientists are always wanting to dive into the details. So like, you know, there's these plots we have where like there's these huge changes that are like from the top of the plot to the bottom that kind of set this, uh, this paradigm that oxygen rose like a, around halfway through its history. And then, you know, a dissertation work, you're not looking at that huge step function. You're looking at like the little wiggles on the side of it that helped that, you know, kind of led up to that big change. Um, and that's one of the things in science, right? Like sometimes there's this big picture question that, that other people are have been addressing for decades, and you're trying to fill in some details that help support that big picture. Um, and I won't go into the details because then you'd lose some viewers, but um, that's, you know, a lot of my dissertation work was on those sort of little details off to the side. The details are fun, though. I mean, when you think about the, the oh, yeah. entirety of Earth history, if I take like maybe this side as the beginning of Earth and that side as, you know, today, for more than half of it, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, and yet our planet was very much alive. And we've talked yeah. about uh, oxygen in past shows as being an important biosignature, so a signature of life on other worlds. Um, but it's far from sure, right? I mean, you also made some computer simulations that show that you can use oxygen as that can be produced without any life. So tell us more about this, this oxygen and how valuable it is to explore for life elsewhere. Well, so the, right. So oxygen is one of the things that life makes that we'd, we'd instantly recognize. If, it, if we were looking at Earth with a telescope, we'd see the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. And there'd be, that'd be a kind of a telltale sign that there was probably life on, on Earth because that's a, that's a gas that's really hard to keep in the atmosphere unless life is making it at massive quantities or something's making it at massive quantities. And life's the best explanation for that. But one of the challenges we have is like whether I'm talking to another scientist from another field or um, you know, a family member, one of the questions we get is like, well, you're talking about aliens, right? Like, how how are you going to know if it's like some alien form of life that's like weird and different from like what we have on modern day Earth? Um, and there's two things you can do. One is you can go to places like in the background of your uh, of, of your image right there and go to places that are on modern day Earth that are really weird today, but life still exists. The other thing you can do is you can go backwards in time to when the Earth had different environments in its past. And this period of time, that half of Earth's history you were talking about, uh, <laughs> that half of Earth's history you were talking about before, where there was no oxygen but life, think about what I, we were saying at the, at the outset, right? If we're planning to look for oxygen as our biosignature, we might have missed it for that first half of, 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 of Earth's history, um, and maybe about a third of the history of life on Earth. So then we started thinking about like what other signals would tip us off that there was life on Earth before oxygen was present on Earth. And, and we, we started looking at like, you know, certain organic gases that life makes. Um, there's actually kind of like this global smog layer that we, that was kind of the details I was talking about. Originally we were like, oh, it was kind of interesting and fascinating. There was like this, you know, orange haze over the sky um, of Earth at, at that time, or at least for parts of the time. Um, it turns out that actually may be a biosignature, the sign that we recognize that life was present on a, a planet without oxygen, um, that, that it may be hard to sustain that on an otherwise Earth-like world unless you had massive quantities of methane being produced by a, by a biosphere. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where I started off thinking about, like, oxygen – in the atmosphere of early Earth, or the lack of oxygen in, in the atmosphere, and that's taken me all the way to like, well, well how do we know that that planet's alive? So the I ancient call them possum Earth. planets. They're playing, you know, they're they're playing dead, right? You wouldn't. You have to make sure you know how to to know they're alive. 
Yeah, no, that's a good way to put it. I mean, the ancient Earth was essentially an exoplanet, right? It was so different than modern Earth. The sun was fainter, it was spinning faster, no grass, no animals, no trees, the atmosphere was different, the moon was closer, the, the tides were stronger. Yeah, yeah. The, U <laughs> the UV flux yeah. from the sun was stronger. So how has studying the ancient Earth kind of tipped you off to a career in understanding other planets? You know, it's, uh, let me let me actually generalize for a second. Like, if you if you look at the people that have been leading some of the the astrobiology miss, missions for NASA, like um, John Grotzinger, Abby Allwood, uh, myself, Jada Arney on the telescope side, the the, the former two people are, are people that lead Mars rover missions. There's actually a rich history of people um, doing work on early Earth and then pivoting and doing work on other planets. And I think it's it's what you're saying, Sanjay, right? Like. Early Earth is the most alien planet for which we have data on its biosphere, right? Um, we don't have a biosphere that we've discovered beyond Earth yet. Um, so the most different you can get from Earth are, is sort of the most different past that it presents to us. And that that's in this era of the Archean when, when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Because everything was different except, there, except for two things. One, there was still water. And two, there was still life, right? And just about everything else was, was dramatically different. And the kind of life we had was different. Um, so... By looking at that, it, it it does kind of two things. It makes you take all these principles of what we call Earth system science, right? To think about how the atmosphere and the oceans and the biology and the and the sun's energy, how all that stuff interacts. And you're taking, you're trying to bait, like kind of like tease out the most basic principles so that you could not just describe modern day Earth, but also this vastly different ancient Earth. And if you can describe both modern Earth and ancient Earth, despite their differences, with then you, you're onto something, because then, then both your intuition and the models that come out of your intuition are generalized enough to handle these vastly different cases. Um, and we can't be certain that it's going to be able to handle all the like diversity of cases, and it probably, you know, the diversity of cases out there in the universe is probably much broader, but at least you're validating against the diversity of cases that we have data on today. Um, and, and just by doing that, your models are becoming more flexible. I think your brain is becoming more flexible. It's it's good for the astrobiologist's soul, I think, to, to, to think about early Earth. Yeah, the rocks, after all, are the history books of our planet, and yet the pages are scattered all over the world. So how do we read them, and how do we get... The and some are ripped out. We're missing some pages from that book. It's so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> That's the fun part of it. So in yeah. terms of biosignatures on other worlds, like what we know, how a planet, how a life influence a planet is very much driven by the only life that we know of is terrestrial life. What kind of work is going on in your in your team to identify biosignatures that can possibly be agnostic, like really not care about what type of life is there? So let me actually let me give a, a shout out before I even start uh, your your guest last week was Sarah Walker, right? Indeed. So she she's actually one of the people that got us starting to think about this. And this is the other cool thing about astrobiology, the way it's emerging as um, uh, almost a field into itself. Uh, you know, Sarah Walker's been thinking about that question of agnostic biosignatures as it applies mostly and historically she's, she's been thinking about this for icy worlds like Europa and Enceladus in our solar system and thinking about what could we understand about the chemistry of an ocean that would tell us that there was life swimming around in that ocean. Um, but recently she's been talking to the exoplanet scientists like myself about how we can take those same principles and apply them to exoplanets. Now the challenge is we're not going to have a rover or a submarine um, crawling around or swimming around and sampling a soil or, or some water that we can then use analytical chemistry to find out every single trace species that's in that sample, right? So we can't get the level of detail of understanding as a result on an exoplanet that we're going to get for Mars or Europa or anything else that we can send a rover or a robot to. The way we're thinking, and this is like super preliminary and we haven't really um, worked out the details yet, is what you may be able to do is you may be able to like ascertain or model using our computer models the the underlying complexity in an atmosphere um, that results from the top level chemicals that are present in it, and and the the basic the most basic way I could explain it is like there's some gases like oxygen that sort of have a family of reactions associated with them. There's other gases like methane that have a family of reactions that are associated with them. Now, if you have methane in the atmosphere without oxygen, that's going to have sort of one set of reactions. If you have oxygen in the atmosphere without methane, that's another 
another set. If you've got both together, two things happen. One, you've, you've now got both families, but there's sort of additional families of reactions that come into play and become really important when that sort of connect those two families. Um, and, and that the, impl the implied diversity of the chemical network when you've got the oxygen and the methane there together um, might be the biosignature that we have for modern day Earth. Now just take everything I said and imagine sort of different pairs of molecules, not just oxygen and methane, but you, you, you start to get at like what's in the atmosphere, what are the major species, and what does that imply for the underlying network of reactions connecting those major species. Um, that may be a way to quantify um, our assessment of whether or not a planet has life. And it would be agnostic because at that point you're not assuming that the life's making oxygen or methane or any particular gas. What you're trying to do is measure how complex the atmospheric chemistry is based on what you're seeing and comparing that to a case, a null case, where, where a planet did not have life and how complex the chemistry would be uh, if there was nothing making, um, no life making gases at the surface. So you're looking for the signature of the, the contribution of life in the atmosphere. So life changes yeah. the atmosphere of a planet. I mean, this is the case for modern Earth today, and it is so life processes on, a, on the surface of a planet far away changes the chemistry of an atmosphere, and how complex that chemistry is what we can then look for using telescopes. Yeah, that was a shorter, better way of saying it. Yes. Yeah, let's, let's make sure I understood. This is really fascinating work. Yeah. So let's let's speak about telescopes a little bit. I mean, the first Please exoplanet one, was... One this. thing, can I just add yeah, one yeah. thing to that? That oxygen and methane example I had, one of the thing, one of the reasons we can do that and play these games where we're looking at the different families of reactions is you essentially have one family that is dominant now today and another family that was dominant back uh, in the Archean before oxygen rose. Um, and and they're, you know, as long as life's there, they're both there to some degree, but only because it's in part because we've had sort of these different phases of Earth that we're, we understand the full diversity of chemicals and reactions that has ha or that happens in a planetary atmosphere. Sorry. You're about to pivot. Oh, I'll let you pivot. No, that's fine. So the Archean is a time period of Earth from zero, so it formation to two and a half billion years ago, and we still have two billion years since then until today. So it's a very, very, very long time ago. If we take again this yeah. uh, this this time scale as evolution of Earth history, like dinosaurs are like here. <laughs> so very recent. So we're talking about time periods on Earth very, very long time ago, which is amazing that we can do science of, on Earth from that time period. It's just so cool. Anyways, I was pivoting because um, we talk about telescopes, which is really something very exciting, particularly because today the European Union uh, authorized the development of, this, of the exoplanet atmospheric seeker uh, space telescope called Ariel, which will fly, I think, in the 2020s something. So it's, it's very appropriate that we talk about telescopes today. But, you know, the first exoplanet was discovered in 1995 um, using telescopes, and a lot, a lot has changed in our understanding of exoplanets, particularly on the scientific side, but also on the technological side. And now scientists work together with engineers to kind of fine-tune the telescopes based on our understanding. Can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of space telescopes since the mid-90s and until up to what you're working on, which is the Louvoir telescope, which we'll talk quite a bit in a bit. Well, so what, you know, the first thing I'll just point out is that the time scales for these things is really long. You know, the telescopes we're, we're thinking about that we're conceptualizing today wouldn't launch for 20 years. So for any students there, just keep that in your mind for if I talk about Louvoir. It's not going to launch for 20 years. So if you think that's cool, um, you know, do good at school. And then, like, you could be on the science or the engineering team with us when that thing launches. Um, you have time to, to get to my level of your career before that happens. But to, that also has implications for going back in time because you said, you know, like, the first exoplanets were discovered in the 90s. The tel even JWST, which we're about to flop, or which we're about to launch, you know that that telescope was really being conceptualized at the time that our first exoplanets were still being discovered, and before we had found any Earth-like exoplanets. And the implications are that you know, Webb's an awesome telescope, and it's going to do some amazing things for exoplanets along with Ariel and some other missions. They're going to start thinking about the chemical diversity of worlds that are out there beyond our solar system. Um, but we've we've never designed a telescope from the start, um, especially at this flagship scale, with the intention of looking at exoplanets, and particularly around the idea of looking at potentially habitable exoplanets and looking for signs of life. Now, everything we would do with a future telescope is going to going to sort of leverage 
leverage and, and utilize the stuff we've done in the past, right? Like Hubble's taught us about how to make telescopes that can see all the way down into the ultraviolet really well and how to make them last long and how to service them so we continue and upgrade them with new generations of instruments. Uh, JWST is teaching us about how to build bigger telescopes because if you haven't seen the, the videos of Webb, it's like this transformer telescope that is going to start off all packaged up in the rocket and then it's going to like unfold to this huge aperture. Um, that And that big aperture, the bigger, it's almost like having a bigger camera lens, it lets you see fainter stuff, which for astronomers means further away. Um, then we're at the same time, like as soon as Webb's done, we're going to start seriously building this, this next telescope, W first, which is developing a special technology called the coronagraph, which will block out the starlight. So like, uh, whoop, so this is a corona here, a coronagraph for a sun here. And if you block out the corona of the, or the, the, the sun, you can see the corona around the sun, right? So a coronagraph for an exoplanet is doing the same thing we do to, to study the sun's corona. Um, only instead of studying the corona of a, the sun, we're blocking out the starlight to study an exoplanet right next to that star. So we're developing that technology further to be able to block out 10 billion photons from the star for every photon we get from the planet. Um, you put all that together, right? You take the, the ability to build UV telescopes and make them last a long time, which Hubble taught us, with uh, building bigger telescopes, which is what Webb is teaching us, with the ability to block out starlight so we can see these individual Earth-like exoplanets, which is the technology W first is helping develop. You put all that together into a single future telescope, which we're calling Louvoir, or HabEx is another version of it. Um, and that is what you will need to be able to look for signs of life and look at like the chemical composition of these Earth-like exoplanets, or potentially Earth-like exoplanets. Um, and I am so excited about that. Like I am, I'm literally all in on it. Like my, my whole career right now is dedicated to thinking about how to do this best um, and what, which missions we could fly. Um, it gets into budgets and stuff like that. But like, like I really want to dedicate the rest of my life to this enterprise of like finding um, signs of life on exoplanets or looking so thoroughly for those signs of life and having not found them, um, start to put some really good constraints on just how lonely the universe is. I want to get, I want to die in one of those, one of those two scenarios, either knowing that we're alone or knowing that we're pretty lonely. Or I'm sorry, either knowing that we're not alone or knowing that we're pretty lonely. Right. That has a lot of implications, I think, right? If we're alone in the universe, that means, you know, humanity are the guardians of intelligence in the, in the, in the galaxy, right? And are, we, are we prepared for such a responsibility? You know, I'm not sure. So I, this is where astrobiology and, and exoplanet science becomes really important, is it, it brings back a, a sense of humility of where we are on the planet, perhaps even a sense of responsibility of, for life in the universe. So um, philosophy aside. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's why, it's, I mean, this is why it's so exciting, right? This is, someone, someone said to me, I think it was Matt Mountain, there's, there's only going to be one time in, in human history where we, as a scientific community, prove or, or convince, um, collect, collect enough data to draw the conclusion that we're not alone. That's going to happen one time. And there's, I think there's a good chance that that one time happens while we're alive. That's cool. That is very cool. Wow. I guess. Tingling in my spine thinking about that. And by the way, the, the, your your aura about Louvoir, I can feel it from here. Right? It's really intense, and I'm really <laughs> excited for you. That you, that's so it, it's so part of who you are now. It's awesome. It's such a fundamental well, the, telescope. And just the last thing on this, you know, big stuff like this did. You know, the flagship missions NASA flies and and our other uh, uh, partner space agencies. They don't happen with a small team of like me and a couple friends here, like at NASA Goddard, right? Like, I'm glad you bring that up. When we build big projects like this, we build them for the science community and really for 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 the global community, right? For our for citizens across the world, because the data we pull down are going to be first of all open to the public because it's that's what happens with our flagship missions. But B, they'd have to be because this, the 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 processing of that information is such a, a difficult scientific problem. It requires all hands on deck. We need geologists there uh, helping us interpret the data. We need biologists. It can't just be the astronomers looking at those at the data from a, a mission like Louvoir. So you know, Louvoir is going to be your mission too, for sure. Oh. I'm excited to see the data. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. So in addition to being a scientist, you are the father of a, of a lovely little daughter. How are you able to, to, to do both successfully? I mean, science is a very intense <laughs> career, and it's, it goes without saying that it takes a lot of time. Um, how are you able to balance both? Uh, a lot of caffeine, for one. <laughs> 
um, coffee, you know, it, if it weren't for that, I don't think I'd get through a day, much less a week or a month. Um, a lot of it is trying to be as present as I can be wherever I'm at. Um, but that, that can be hard too, because sometimes you've got an emergency from work happening when you're home or vice versa. Um, but I, I try to, I try when I'm with my kid, Maya, who's four at home to really be with her and to be focused on her. I only get a few hours a night with her, right? I mean, I, I tend, I'm the, I'm the bus in our family right now, right? I go up, pick her up from daycare and I, and I go home, I generally cook dinner and we eat dinner as a family and we maybe do one or two other activities and then it's bedtime. And in that, in that span of time, I'm not on email. I'm not, um, uh, maybe I'm on Slack because sometimes I've, my students have an emergency they need to tend to, but I try to be pretty focused. Um, and, and you'll see, like if you looked at my email records, like you'll see there's like a hole between like 5 p.m. and like nine, my kid goes to bed late. She doesn't like going to sleep. So like between like <laughs> nine or 10 p.m. Um, where I'm not on email. Uh, but then after she goes to sleep, I'll go downstairs, I'll open up my laptop and I'll start, you know, emailing people again or put, pulling together whatever thing was due today or tomorrow or yesterday that I have to finish up. And I'll do that till I go to sleep. And then I wake up with her and I'm, I'm making breakfast with her and I've got an hour or two in the morning with her. So it, part of it is trying to build boundaries around my life at home um, for those precious few hours a day I have with my family. Um, can't always do it, but I do my best. That's words of wisdom. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so for those of you who are watching, uh, please use hashtag ask Astrobio to submit your questions either on Twitter or put them directly on the Saganet.org chat. And we'll open them up to uh, Sean in just a few minutes. The last question I want to ask you, because we could talk about this stuff forever, but uh, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of students watching on Ask an Astrobiologist, and I was wondering perhaps you have some, some, some guidance, some, some advice for them as they start building their career to become astrobiologists. I, the best, so the, the cheesy advice is like to find something you love and do it, right? I think if you want to really excel in astrobiology, it, there's a more general version of that, which is like find all the things you love and then find the place they intersect, right? So if you're really in astrobiology, you also need to find out um, what discipline you want to have as a basis, right? Because I'm, I'm, I come at astrobiology fundamentally as an Earth scientist that's trained to think about planets as these interacting systems. Astronomers come at it with a different perspective. Um, they come at it from an observer's perspective, sometimes from a big data perspective. When I'm in the room with an astronomer, oh, and a biologist comes at it from a different perspective, right? They're often looking at it from the perspective of a cell or some biochemistry. When, I, when we have all those folks in the same room interacting together, our solutions are much stronger than it is if I were doing it. I, I really believe that the smartest person alive couldn't do this stuff on their own. You need a bunch of really smart people working together. So all that is to say, it's not enough to just love astrobiology. You have to find that other thing, that bi biology or the chemistry or the astronomy or the geology that you also love and want to be an expert in. And then the other aspect to this is find the... And the kind of thing you love to do. I love computers. Like I'm a nerd. I would be happy sitting at a terminal all day writing code and trying to get it to work and debugging it. Um, so that that means I'm also going to be willing to stay up late at night doing that. Um, if you love outdoors, maybe you want to be doing field work. If you love um, all the pictures we get from Hubble and all these other great telescopes on the ground and in space, maybe you want to be an observer. If you love lab work, if you love like tinkering around, maybe you want to be in the lab. You have to find all all these things about what you enjoy and what you're good at and, and you have to find out what you're good, not good at, right? Like I know I'm a really bad lab scientist, right? So if you're an undergrad, it, there's always a temptation to focus too early to get those letters of recommendation that say this person's ready to pick up a PhD tomorrow. I think it's important to, sh to demonstrate as an undergrad today that you can do research. But I also think it's important for you to experiment a little bit with different kinds of scientific um, internships so that you can find out what you really like on the day to day. Because um, ultimately, you're going to you're, you're going to have to work hard. Like it's just that's just reality. It's hyper competitive in our market right now for, for getting jobs and proposals and all that. And. Even if I, and I tell my students this all the time, even if I, as your boss, say you don't have to work hard, which I don't think they do, like not for me, but they do have to work hard for themselves. Because if they're not, some other student at some other institution is working hard and their CV is going to be that much stronger as a result. 
Um, so, and it's easier to work hard if you love all the parts of what you're doing, right? Not just the big picture question of are we alone, but like the little detailed questions that are helping build up to that question. And also you also, you also have to love the techniques you're applying to the detailed and the big picture questions. So don't just find the thing you love. We all love astrobiology. I know the details you love about that question. So that brings me to my next point, and I'll open up to the questions in a second. But I'm sure, like me, you get a lot of emails from students all over the world who are asking, how do I become an astrobiologist? Astrobiology is not at my university. I want to become an astrobiologist. How do I do it? What do you respond to that? It partially depends on the student. If if they're an undergrad, what if they're if I if I can sit down with them, I'll try to. Um, but the main thing is look at the institutions that offer astrobiology programs for graduate school. It's I think more important to be at a good astrobiology institution for graduate school than it is for undergrad. Um, you can be behind in, in astrobiology and undergrad and catch up in grad school. It, and you can do it after grad school too, right? If you're a grad student out there and you want to pivot to astrobiology, you can do that too. Um, if you're an undergrad, the way to pivot is to go to a grad school that's good at it. <clears throat> if you're a grad student, the ways to pivot are A, go to AbGradCon where you're going to meet other people interested in astrobiology and you what can start building up the network. What's that? What is AbGradCon? It is the Astrobiology Graduate Conference. It's where, no, we've had at AbSciCon, but it's, you and I hung out there a lot back in the day. It's, mm -hmm. It is an informal conference for, by, and of graduate students and postdocs, early career people. Um, it's awesome, and if you want to be an astrobiologist and, and you're in grad school, I cannot recommend going there strongly enough, especially if you're at an institution where you're not building up that interdisciplinary thinking and network um, at the institution itself. And then the last thing is if you're a grad student um, and you want to get more into astrobiology and it's not something your advisor does or your your, your home department does, um, look at postdocs that take the skill set you're developing as a PhD student, the specific research skills you're developing on your dissertation, and find a way to turn those tools to astrobiological questions. I have a postdoc in our group right now that didn't do any astrobiology research in, in, in her PhD work, but she has a great flexible molecular modeling tool that she can apply apply to astrobiological questions. So she's taking her the, the detailed expertise and tools she developed as a PhD student, and now she's in our in our lab, in our group, applying those to specific astrobiology questions. And you know, she's an astrobiologist now, because she's doing that stuff. Um, so you can always use your postdoc or your next postdoc to pivot as well. I can totally relate. I discovered astrobiology halfway through a master's degree, and it completely changed my academic path. So it's possible. <laughs> All right, enough of us, yeah. um, at least enough of me. It's time to open it up for uh, questions. Oh, yeah. And uh, again, if you're watching, please use hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter or ask your question directly on the Segnet.org chat, and uh, we'll ask Sean about them. So the first one is a great question. It talks about the planetary context in addition to the biosignature, mm -hmm. I think is important, and we get, didn't get a chance to talk about that. But maybe Maybe we can hear. So this is uh, at Sophie Grayson asks, what are the criteria to be considered a habitable planet? I read an article today about how planets aren't considered habitable because they have too much water. Are there any uncommon things that detract from the likelihood of a planet being habitable? That's a great question. Um, I think so. Let me break this into two into two pieces, right? Because some one of the things that's really hard about astrobiology is because it's so exciting, it's hard to write a paper and not have a headline about the paper um, overemphasize like your conclusions, right? So, mm -hmm. um, I I don't I don't think I've read the news articles related to that. I've seen some of the headlines about like you know some of these worlds might have too much water. There are reasons to think that that might be the case. Um, but I don't think we can really be conclusive about that yet, right? Um, now, the reasons that you that too much water might be a bad thing is is you know if you imagine life needing a certain amount of nutrients um, and having sort of some constant rate of nutrients coming up into an ocean, uh, but then you make the ocean like a thousand times, a hundred to a thousand times as big, you've now diluted all those nutrients in much in a much bigger water pool. Um, it also can have implications for the way that uh, nutrients get recycled. Um, it might be less efficient. It might uh, it has implications for the heat flow from from below if you start forming like ice layers at the bottom of an ocean, which you can form these like sort of dense uh, forms of ice if you if your oceans become too thick. That could prevent convection. That that leads to good heat release, but also good nutrient cycling. 
cycling at the ocean floor. Um, you also would lose continents and weathering and some amount of climate stability from that. There's all kinds of things that I could imagine going wrong if you've got oceans that are too deep. However, we don't have any planets that have like literal ocean, like Kevin Costner style ocean worlds um, that are totally covered by ocean and that have these like, you know, much more massive water reservoirs. And, and I, and I think the best way to think about articles like that, both in, in, in the scientific literature and in um, the, the, the press is that's a hypothesis that having too much water is a bad thing. And it's a hypothesis that we should test and the test is going to be to build, you know, a telescope that can see a variety of worlds and look for signs of life on it. What I'd like to do is look for biosignatures on one of these super water rich worlds, not give up on it, actually look and then look for it on a, on a planet that has oceans more like what we have on modern day Earth. Um, and then the prediction would be that the, the first planet wouldn't have biosignatures, uh, at least or as a class of planet, they wouldn't be as common or as strong as they are on the more Earth like world. One of the things I love the most about astrobiology is this really strong creative nature you have to have to try and imagine those faraway worlds and detach yourself from the biases you have about life on Earth and extrapolate those insights to other worlds. And so one has to be careful about, make, about making such big uh, conclusive statements, you know, because we just don't know yet. <laughs> and let's like the, and the big thing is like, don't give up, right? Like, j like there's reasons to doubt, but let's turn that into a hypothesis to test with like observation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, next question is by Michael Wong, also an excellent question, who asks, what would Earth's biggest biosignature be before the rise of oxygen? I think it's, okay, so biggest can be taken in a number of ways. I think the biggest, the, the most observable thing um, would have been the presence of, of an organic uh, haze that may have been, that we think was present for, for periods of, of Earth history early on. Um, that would have had a whopping big signal in terms of how it affects the distribution of colors from the planet. The planet, instead of being a pale blue dot, would have been like a pale orange or pale lemony yellow dot. Um, and that would have been, that would have been like totally apparent. The hard thing becomes knowing for sure that that kind of haze or, or aerosol I couldn't have formed without life. We actually have an example of that in our own solar system on Titan. So you have to make sure that you, you, you assess the chemical, uh, the chemical composition of the planetary atmosphere sufficiently to rule out non-biological, like just purely atmospheric photochemistry processes um, and, and make sure that that's not making the haze that you're seeing. Um, we think that if you, if you detect a lot of CO2 in that planetary atmosphere, that that would um, put a break on haze formation to the point where you could only make it if you're making tremendous amounts of methane at the surface that are probably only possible with life. Um, but all that said, like, and so that's kind of the, I think the strongest is probably that haze. The next strongest is probably looking at the ratio of methane to, to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in general. Um, but all of those biosignatures I would not put as much confidence in as oxygen, the oxygen we have on modern day Earth, partially because we don't have many good abiotic production mechanisms, non-biological production me mechanisms for oxygen, but we do for methane. And also partially because we've been thinking really hard about the, the, the ways na nature could, could make that oxygen. Um, we haven't been thinking as hard because it's kind of a newer proposal for a biosignature for this hazy stuff. It's, it's new, so and newer stuff in science is just in general less tested, um, and that idea, because it's new, is less tested. So I'm not as confident in it, even though I'm on the papers that proposed it. Um, you have to be honest about you know your own work too. So great question, Mike. Um, so Graham Lau asks a, a very good question. I know you are also very passionate about science communication, so communicating the value of science to the general public. And Graham Lau asks, having met each other through AbGradCon and FameLab, which is a science communication yeah. competition, I wonder if Dr. Domagal Goldman could speak to the importance of creating networking environments for young scientists and communicators to share their interests and collaborate. I, I think it's essential. Um, I. I, I, even though I was sort of like more senior kind of helping like FameLab happen, I was only a postdoc. Um, and I got a tremendous amount of value in my own career from meeting people like Graham um, through, through the FameLab activity and through AbGradCon and, other, and stuff like that. And it, it happens in a number of ways. Um, one of the most important things I think is 
is having a network of people that have shared values to what you have. And, 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 and I mean that in a professional context, right? I value communication a lot. Sanjo, you clearly do by putting the show on. Graham Lau clearly does because of all the amazing stuff that he's been doing in that space. Um, and, and seeing scientists, Jada Arney here at Goddard is another example of someone that's tremendous at communicating science. See, having colleagues that really value the same things you do is so important for a number of reasons. One, I'm learning from watching you and Jada and Graham and other people communicate, um, and I'm going to be better as a result. Number two, it, it can be hard sometimes to communicate both both the the actual act of communication can be difficult because we're trying to distill really complex stuff into 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 language that we can share with people beyond the scientific and the disciplinary enterprise um, but it's also difficult sometimes because it's not always valued by our other peers and so having that that network of people that can support you when it's hard um, and when you might be struggling to get the support from your institution or from your colleagues and 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 up against the the public or parish pressure, which is very real in the sciences, and having that that moral support is is in, tremendously important. Um, but then, lastly, like I I have gotten so lucky by having um, colleagues that I love to work with uh, that I became basically friends with before we were professional colleagues, right? And and it's through FameLab and at GradCon and and these summer and winter schools in astrobiology that. I developed an inherent trust in people, not just in general, but specific people like Graham and Sanjoy and Jada and Sarah Walker and Beitul and like there, there's this wonderful group of people that I trust as people, as individuals that I know have high moral standing because I was, I developed sort of that outside of having to go ask them for uh, advice or input or funding or whatever in a more professional setting. Um, it It's really been different for me interacting with the people that, that I've been working with as astrobiologists since grad school um, compared to people I've met later in my career, where I, I, I want to develop that trust, but it's just harder to do once you're more advanced in your career. Um, so all that stuff, I think I've, I've benefited from in many ways. So thanks, Graham, for the question and all your communication work and all, uh, all the support we're, we're giving each other. And it really excites you as a scientist when you share your interest and then the, the public gets excited with you. It's just like, you know, it kind of yeah. elevates you as a scientist in, in sharing your the, your knowledge and, and what you're excited about. It's, it's, it's a wonderful experience, I find. And, and it's more fun, you know? Like, I know yeah. scientists that don't always enjoy interacting with other people. Um, if you're, and, and that, maybe that's one of the questions you want to ask yourself when I was asking, like, find your passions. I also love working with people. And, and, and in that sense, um, astrobiology is great because it forces you to do that, whether you want to or not. And some of the best questions I've had in astrobiology have come from like seven-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's amazing. Um, Omar Alaidi asks, I'm studying general biotechnology and I'm also interested in botany and astronomy. How would I turn those interests into a career in astrobiology? Wow. Um, it, it part, so for Omar, I think it partially depends on what, what stage of the career you're at. Um, I think, and it also depends on like what your specific tools are. You know, I, there's not a lot of botany astrobiology, although I'll give you a couple examples of things that, that would qualify. Um, one is people looking at how photosynthesis sort of figure out the, 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 the basic physics of how photosynthesis works and then trying to then apply those basic principles to another planet around another star that maybe has a different color distribution um, coming from the star and hitting the surface of the planet and then predicting what the, the colors of plants might be on that world, especially the leaves that, are, that, are, that have the pigments in them to collect light. Uh, Nancy Kiang, K-I-A-N-G, is one of the, 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 the people that's leading thoughts on that. Uh, Nikki Peranto is also looking at, at the distribution distribution of pigments in the field that that, that that bacteria and biology use on Earth that feeds into Nancy's work. Um, so you might want to look into the work that those two individuals are doing. Uh, there's work out of Lisa Kaltenegger's group also thinking about building up a generalized set of pigments, a library of pigments um, to, to look at that sort of stuff. Now the biotechnology part of it, that's you know one thing that a lot of uh, the, the, that NASA is looking at are public public private partnerships. And if there's ways for, I'm not a biotechnologist, right? So I don't, I can't give you something specific, but I 
would be surprised if there wasn't some collaboration between biotechnology firms that are doing some amazing um, stuff in terms of uh, mass producing, using life to help mass produce stuff that's otherwise hard to make in large quantities, um, combined with some astrobiological need um, for you know understanding how some specific metabolism works or something like that. I don't know. There, there's got to be some collaboration there. I don't know what it is. Um, if, if we were in a room full of astrobiologists, I'd be turning to one of the biologists in the room. But those are my top level answers, Omar. Thank you, Sean. Graham asks, if you had to make a bet, what do you think was the next major discovery in the realm of astrobiology? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah. Let me let me think on that for a moment. So we kind of have a good estimate on Aedas of birth for exoplanets. Um, the stuff coming up soon. Uh, so here, let me let me throw out let me throw out an observation we're going to be doing that that could go one of a few ways. For let me answer it for the exoplanet specifically. When JWST launches, um, it's going to have the chance to look at some of these potentially habitable worlds around M-type stars. Now, there's a lot of folks that are modelers like me that are worried about the habitability of these planets because the the energy from the, these are stars that are cooler than the sun, they're smaller than the sun, but they're a lot more like active uh, than the sun, and they give off a lot of high energy radiation as a result. Um, and the planet is going to be pretty close to the star because the star is overall cooler, which means you have to get closer to it um, to get energy from the star to be warm and, and habitable. But that high energy is a larger component of that of the total energy from the star. So you're basically bombarding the planet with high energy radiation all the time. There's modelers that that are worried about that on a num for a number of reasons. The most basic is you might literally just kind of like blow the atmosphere off the world, and then it's kind of hard to keep an ocean on a planet without an atmosphere uh, and the atmosphere pressure keeping the water liquid water stable. Um, now that's all a model prediction. JWST should be able to look at these worlds and see at the very least whether or not that model prediction is correct. If it is, and those those planets end up being airless, um, it means that they're they're going to be really bad abodes for life. If those planets have atmospheres, then we're going to want to look for signs of life on them. And, and that, that's going to happen in a, a few phases. One, JWST, um, uh, potentially this Ariel mission that Sanjay mentioned earlier, and eventually and especially uh, extremely large telescopes on the ground are going to be able to look for signs of life on those worlds and those atmospheres. Um, so the next the next big question for exoplanets are is really like are 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 M planets around these these cooler M type stars are they bare balls of rock? Or do they retain our atmospheres or find some way to regenerate them after after this sort of hyperactivity phase of this of the its host stars died down a little bit? That's a huge question. I, I, I think we probably can't answer it until web launches, but we should shortly thereafter. Um, I'm going to go with that off the top of my head. Brilliant. Banishika Datta asks, if we aimed a telescope at an exoplanet far, far away, how would we know the chemical composition of its atmosphere at present day versus the planet's atmospheric composition at some distant time in the past? So that's a, I like that um, because one of the things we talk about it as astronomers is like how far away the targets are and how long ago the, the light left that world. Now I'll tell you, to be honest, whether or not we found um, life that was on a planet some number of years ago um, that's now gone because the light took so long to get here or whether we found it in like literally today, existing today. As, as an astrobiologist that's just trying to get at the question of are we alone, it, it is – it's not as important as just finding the biosignatures in the first place. I'd be just as happy to find, you know, evidence of life from a billion years ago. Take Mars, for example, right? We we send rovers to Mars all the time, and that's mostly to look for signs of extinct life on Mars, um, with, with some exceptions. Um, if we found evidence of extinct life on Mars from three billion years ago, even if it wasn't crawling around on the surface, I would be, you know, popping a bottle of champagne and celebrating because it would be huge news for astrobiology. Um, that all said... Um, it actually is not that big of a delay. You know, a lot of times you hear about these stories of light coming from distant galaxies where the light left billions of years ago. 
because these observations of exoplanets are so hard, especially for the potentially Earth-like ones that are small and relatively dim, um, we're only going to be able to do this in our local stellar neighborhood. So we're not going to be looking at this for distant galaxies. We're really not even looking for it in stars that are on the other side of our galaxy. This is going to be sort of in our neighborhood. Um, I, I, I like I, the analogy I get here is like we've been living in this neighborhood as a planet for like, you know, four and a half billion years. And we're finally going to get out and knock on the door of the neighbors and just see who's home but it's only going to be within a radius of uh i think something like you know 10 to a 50 light years or so um and that even that's stretching it so um you know we're we're, we're only going to be looking for light that's coming from like a year ago to 50 years ago when it left that exoplanet excellent if you had unlimited resources what astrobiology project would you choose to do and why If I had unlimited resources, um, I, well, if it's truly unlimited, I don't have to choose. And then I do a coordinated search for life on Mars and the icy worlds and on exoplanets um, and everywhere in between. Um, but but if I have to choose one project, I would I would do Louvoir. Um, I, and for a number of reasons. Um, the One of the things that people get excited about when they think about life beyond Earth is, you know, civilizations, right? Like complex life doing interviews uh, and tweeting on another world. Um, that's not possible in our solar system, right? We There might be life on Mars or on Europa or extinct life on Mars, but they're not tweeting um, or doing anything remotely like it. But there is at least the possibility that more complex advanced forms of life exist on these planets beyond Earth. So there's, I think, a huge public interest in doing the search for life on exoplanets specifically. Now, we're not looking for that intelligent life, but we're looking for the kinds of biospheres that would at least allow for it. The second is just the sheer um, sample size that we're going to get from, from looking not not just on one target, but looking on a number of targets, up to up to 50 or 60 uh, potentially Earth-like worlds, and looking for biosignatures on a, on a survey of samples. And thirdly, I think the stuff we learn from that mission, regardless of whether or not we find life on those planets, is going to profoundly impact the way we think about Earth-like planets. Um, we've learned a lot about Earth by looking at other planets in our solar system. And yet, Earth is the only planet for which we have a stable liquid water ocean, and it's the only planet for which we have life. Even if we don't find concrete evidence of life on potentially habitable, which means ocean-bearing or potentially ocean-bearing worlds, um, on these exoplanets, if we look for it, even if we fail, we are going to learn so much more about how planets with oceans, with liquid water oceans um, at the surface, operate that I think it's going to really impact the way we think about Earth 50 years from now. And that's even if we fail in our search for life. Um, on top of all that, as an astrobiologist, I love not just the search for life, but putting it in the context of like the cosmic origins and the history of how Earth-like planets came to be. And Louvoir is going to do a number of things in terms of the origins of stars and planets and the way that matter gets recycled in a galaxy and beyond a galaxy to even create the conditions that are right for star, star formation in the first place. Um, and it's going to help us with the other missions we're doing to Europa and Mars because we can point our telescopes at those objects in the solar system. We can look for methane, con you know, methane measure methane concentrations in with good spatial resolution across the Martian surface um, and do that basically when not whenever we want but but more or less whenever we want we can help look for geysers on Europa or Enceladus that we could send other spacecraft to fly through and collect samples for Louvoir's kind of like a, uh, a a super awesome fancy pocket knife uh, for astrobiology or whatever you need it's going to have a tool to help you out with it um, which is the other reason if I could do one thing for astrobiology that that would be it well fingers crossed for that the mission flies <laughs> indeed we have a question from Facebook who, uh, who asks where do you think we will find extra extraterrestrial life first somewhere in the solar system or an extra extrasolar planet so let me let me back off my assumptions of whether or not there is life on um, particular targets. Let's just assume for the sake of my answer that there's life on Mars, that there's life on Europa, and there's life on Enceladus, and that there's, uh, there's life on these exoplanets. My guess is that we probably have the best shot at finding it on Europa first, um, although 
It, you know, the amazing thing about this is we're talking about doing all this stuff almost at the same time, right? Like, you know, the, the NASA's talking about sending and, and private companies are talking about sending people to Mars in the next 20 to 30 years. We're talking about bringing samples back from Mars and potentially uh, analyzing samples at Europa, including liquid water, Europa, maybe Enceladus. Um, and we're talking about these big space telescopes that would look for biosignatures on exoplanets. All that stuff, you know, it, you know, it's not like one's happening next year and the other's happening 50 years from now. We're talking about all of these missions on the time scale of sometime between 10 years from now and 30 years from now. Um, and whether one's going to be 10 versus 30 is dependent on like budgets and, you know, the you know space politics and like what missions get prioritized and stuff like that. Um, it could be any one of them first, to be honest. Um, and and the, the thing that's really cool to me is thinking about how exoplanet discoveries are going to be informed by what we do or do not find on Mars and what we do or do not find uh, in Europa and Enceladus and vice versa, how exoplanet uh, exploration is going to impact what we think about the discoveries on Mars or Europa or Enceladus or other worlds closer to home. Um, that's that's one of the things that, that I think is um, currently understudied in astrobiology because we've been thinking so um, deeply about how to find life in any particular target and the missions we designed to do that, um, I think we haven't thought enough about what we'd learn from one target and how that would inform our search for life on another target. We're starting to, but I think that's that's one of the things if you're a student that's really interested in astrobiology, that someone could come in and make a really cool impact, especially because some of these agnostic quantitative biosignatures that Sarah Walker and other people have proposed um, actually open up the, the door for us to be making more comparisons across these very different targets with otherwise very different uh, observational techniques. Wonderful. Well, Sean, we're out of time for the rest of the questions, but uh, hopefully you can, you can join up on, on SegaNet and answer them there. I'm so grateful for the time you took to spend with us today. I know you're an extremely busy scientist. And, uh, you know, thanks from all of us. It's been a wonderful chat with you this morning and uh, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are and where you're watching this. But take care of yourself, and we, all see you, we will all see you next month for Ask an Astrobiologist. And until then, stay curious. Bye for now.